Okay, good morning, folks. I'm Nate Angel, and uh, we are uh, here in the second week of the Open Learning Journey track at MyFest 22. And we're going to be kicking off our program in just a second. Um, I'm calling in from uh, sunny Portland, Oregon, where it's actually rainy today, um, which is typical for Portland, Oregon. And I'd just also like to say that I am a uh, uninvited but very thankful settler on the Nichiwana uh, indigenous lands here in the Multnomah Valley. Um, and uh, that's where I'm calling in from today. Uh, and we've got uh, a really exciting program. This is the first of session in what we call our um, hands on open tools uh, learning sessions. We've got a whole, we got five of them this week, I think. And this is the first one. Uh, I just also wanted to make a plug for later this afternoon. We're going to be kicking off a, um, a, uh, uh, the actual the actual kickoff session. Sorry for this week's um, open learning uh, journey track is going to happen this afternoon. And just as I'll send a, a link for that so that you can you can see it. And I invite everybody to attend that as well. Um, our conversation today got scheduled a little bit ahead of that, and that's fine because each session stands alone. Um, and so, with that introduction, uh, I'd uh, like to. Uh, introduce our guest and who's the person who's going to lead us through uh, most of our conversation today, uh, who I just met actually, and I'm really excited to meet because we have here with us today, Royce Kimmins, who uh, is the, the person, uh, the instigator, we should say, behind uh, the EdTech Books platform at edtechbooks.org. Uh, and we're going to be spending a little bit of time today uh, diving into that platform, getting to know it better, uh, understanding why it even exists. And um, to kick things off, I thought I'd just ask Royce to, to kind of introduce himself and talk a little bit about what he what he does with his life and why he's interested in open learning. Great, thanks so much. Um, well, this is what I love. So if you get me talking about this, I'll talk about this all day. So thank you for the invitation. I'm excited to be here with all of you and thank you all for being here. Um, so my background is I was a high school teacher turned web developer, turned instructional designer, turned faculty member. So um, that's kind of my journey, and you can see reverberations of kind of that history and, and what I do and why I do it. But um, so I really care about, I, I do a lot of research on things like usability, accessibility. Uh, my department here is instructional psychology and technology. So like we focus on the nexus between education and technology. Um, and so I do research in, the, in that area around like social media, data mining, and all those kinds of things. But my passion is openness and open learning. This is what keeps me up at night. Um, early in my career, I was at a, at a meeting with Dave Wiley and he, he said, you should study what keeps you up at night. And that really uh, stuck with me. And so I thought, well, what, what do I really care about? And ultimately I care about um, helping to provide educational opportunities to everyone and improving educational opportunities for everyone. And so I, part of what I've studied recently is some of the barriers that prevent people from becoming more open. Specifically faculty members, what prevents us from actually acting on our generous impulses and wanting to share. And um, there are lots of reasons for it, lots of institutional systemic reasons for it. Um, but, um, uh, but this platform is, is kind of part of our, my, uh, our offering to the community to help address some of the, the issues that we see that prevent us from moving more in open directions. So, um, you're gonna. There are a lot of other great sessions that I saw on the on the docket. So um, Pressbooks is a great platform. LibreText is a great platform. Um, this EdTech Books is a platform that we created um, in our, here in our college, and we did it largely trying to create what we wanted ultimately an open textbook or open sharing platform to be and to do. And um, you know, prior to this, I'd used Pressbooks, I'd used WordPress. My previous, one of my previous universities, I managed hundreds of WordPress blogs, thousands of WordPress blogs, actually. And um, so, so we came at this really wanting to figure out how to create the best user experience for faculty, particularly who want to create open resources. Like, what do they need to be successful, and how can we remove as many barriers to that as possible? Um, and so, yeah, so that's kind of where I come from and why, why I'm here. Nate, is that what you wanted to hear? Is there anything else you wanted to hear? I, I want to hear whatever it is that you have to share, comrade. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, really glad to hear it. And so uh, 
I uh, you started to go into a little bit there about um you know the sort of roots of of ed tech books um and uh you know it sounds like it was uh created out of deep experience with with other tools um and so I, one thing that you know maybe at the beginning or as we're going through it um that you could highlight for us is some of the affordances or capabilities that exist in ed tech books that are specifically there yeah. because you were inspired maybe by them not being available in other systems or something that yeah. that would be really interesting to hear i don't know if you have something to say preliminarily about that yeah no absolutely i think um I, yeah i'll point out a lot of different like specific features and functions but i think as i dig into this that i think probably the core idea here is that we're really focusing on usability one of the biggest barriers to uh oer adoption um is lack of perception of quality and one of the biggest barriers to faculty actually creating OER is perceptions of usability, perceptions of their ability to just jump in and start doing it. So I think those are kind of the two guiding principles behind a lot of the decisions and features that we make is that we want to make the experience from the reader side high quality so that it's clear to them so that we don't have to deal with this constant um, myth that OER are lower quality than their commercial counterparts, where, when in actuality what happens is typically um, we're, we're competing against production value of, of a publisher. Um, we're competing against graphic designer they hired, a type editor that they hired, when in actuality the content of OER is often as good or better than, than what a publisher provides. And so like a part of it is we're, we're adding production value to it so that we, we can move past this mis misconception of OER that it's lower quality just based upon we don't have as pretty of a cover as 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 a commercial publisher provides it's sort of like a, a book is judged by its cover right it is it absolutely is and like the biggest um, compliment that i get when people go to ed tech books is well these don't look like open textbooks and that makes me feel good but also bad at the same time because it, it tells me that we are living in a world where open is interpreted as lower quality or or um Great. or whatever and and it's and it comes down to do we have tools that allow us to create things that are that have high perception of, of quality and we often don't um yeah so that and then also the usability piece so can people just jump in and start creating things or do they have to go learn a, you know an entire system that's brand new and that has a lot of learning curves that has a front end and a back end that they have to manage they have to install on a server or something like that and so trying to remove all that i think those are the two guiding principles but there are lots of other sub um uh, like specific features that that i'll show you that are, are unique i think so it sounds like in a sense it kind of comes down to making the experience of reading as as good as possible and also making the experience of authoring yeah. as smooth and easy as possible you know yeah. i'm going to just throw in a link here to another project um that had similar goals uh sita press which is actually uh, more fo focused on literature more than on <clears throat> on on learning materials not that literature can't be learning materials um but they were uh influenced by the same idea of just trying to make the experience better overall. Um, just a little side note here. And of course, we'll be sharing out the uh, links that we all share in chat um, as part of the uh, outcomes from the, the session. Well, I don't want to, you know, I mean, I, I feel like people are probably really interested in diving into the details. Yeah. And so I don't want to, um, <clears throat> I don't want to delay that any longer. That, but if you have other introductory things that you want to um, get across before you dive into kind of walking us through ed tech books itself, I'm happy to hear them. Yeah, no, I think I'm ready to just jump in. All right, well, let's do it then. Let's, uh, and uh, for folks who are in the audience while Royce is getting ready there, you know, if you have really specific things that you want to, um, uh, ask questions about or make suggestions about or whatever. Um, you know, we're a pretty small group here. Feel free to just unmike um, and gracefully uh, ask your question or interrupt if, if necessary. I'm sure Royce is okay with that. Yeah. Um, we can also use chat to pull up. I'll be monitoring that and looking at that and, and can also step in and, and make sure your questions get answered. So don't be shy. Great. So, so what I'll start with is I'm just going to walk you through briefly like what a reader's experience would be with the platform. Um, and so that I'm just going to kind of like demo it, but then once we get past that, I'll have you actually log in and then you can start playing with things as I then start to demo what an author's experience would be like. So let me share my screen. Is that looking okay? So, so I guess first yes. of all, uh, I see it fine. 
Yeah, so edtechbooks.org is the main site, but it's a, it's a system, it's a platform, it's not just a site. So we actually have it hosted on multiple domains, and it's designed to be, um, to be ac accessible through multiple domains. So another site that we have is Equity Press, uh, and this is specifically here because we have a lot of people that were wanting to use EdTech books, but they didn't fit like under the EdTech monitor, moniker. Um, and so Equity Press is a more kind of general platform um, well, for a more general audience. Uh, we also have institutional um, kind of variations of this. And so this is, we have these at BYU. So we have like the BYU Open Textbook Network and BYU Idaho has their own version. Um, but so it's all running on the same source code, but we can just have multiple domains pointing to it, and each domain can have its own, its own unique experience. So this allows us to work with universities if they want to, to have their own customized experience. And we can also share books between the platforms really easily, between the sites really easily. So if you create something on EdTech Books, we can just flip a switch and then it's shown on Equity Press as well or vice versa. Um, so I guess that's just, it, it's not just a site, it's more the platform underlying the site. Um, the platform is, um, we haven't released it as open source yet, but that's the plan to do. It's just that we're developing so quickly um, and have been for a long, long time that if we, if someone else installs it on their server within a week, they're going to be behind, behind the source code. So we've just been, we, we really haven't done a lot in trying to get it up there for other people to install locally. Uh, so most, so really all of our use cases are, um, are using our existing installation. So this runs like if you're, if you want to know the details of it, this runs on Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. So a LAMP server. So it's the same. Uh, underlying technologies is like Pressbooks um, or Drupal or something like that. Hold on, sorry. Okay, so from a reader's perspective, they come here, um, they can quickly find content they're looking for. So we'll just start typing in tech. Um, this is, so it's a collection of books. Some of these are on the outside, so they're not actually hosting ed tech books. So these are just links to other OER. And that is initially our goal was to just make a place where people could go find the OER that they want. So if you hover on something and you see this little red icon, that means it's hosted elsewhere. The things hosted in ed tech books um, will show up here. When you click on it, you see the table of contents. All of this is designed to be mobile optimized. So you'll notice as I resize the screen, it adapts to the, to the width of the screen. Um, everything's designed to be mobile first, meaning that um, historically in the web, what happened was people designed for desktops and laptops, and they, then they retroactively tried to design for mobiles. And it's, um, it's harder to go in that direction. It leads to a lot of accessibility problems versus now modern design typically follows a mobile first approach where you design for a mobile device first and then you scale up. And so um, that's part of, that's how we've done it with this site. Um, we find about a third of our users across the world are accessing on mobile devices, which is really important. Um, so it's really important for us to be accessible to them. Um, and so, so a lot of the design decisions we make in terms of like how we encourage uh, people to actually create content and the tools that we provide to them help to direct them toward this kind of mobile first design approach. Um, so from a reader perspective, they come here, they can begin reading the book, they can download the book, book so that it's available to them as a PDF. Uh, so they can download the entire book as a PDF or they can start reading it or go to a specific chapter. Each chapter is also provided as a PDF, so they can click download and just download this single chapter. This really allows for easy sharing of resources. Everything is also uh, you know, provided as an open URL. URLs are short and clean, so you'll notice that um, you as the author decide what the, what, the, uh, set, um, what the directory is and what the link is, so there's no like ugly URL here, you can completely decide what it, what the entire customized URL looks like. We have a lot of features built in to make this experience as, as helpful as possible to learners. So for instance, navigating through the book, um, you have a side nav here that you can open up. So you can jump to any heading in the chapter you're on. You can jump to a different chapter in the book directly from here and so forth. Also within the, let me jump to a different book that um, shows this better. So we have books, we also have journals that we're hosting in it now. Um, so if we go to this journal, you'll notice if I click this tab over here, I see a reference for it. So I can just copy this for my, if I'm writing a paper, I can just copy this citation, put that in my reference list. I also have a list of all the references that are listed on the, in the chapter. So I can jump down, jump down to those. I also have the link that shows me all the images in the chapter. 
Uh, and again, I can jump through any uh, any headings in the chapter and find any chapter in the book very quickly and rapidly from this navigation. Um, also, every chapter or every book has the ability to automatically predict how long it's going to take someone to read it. This is really helpful for read for my students, like because if they're riding on the bus home and they want to know if they have enough time to read a chapter, they open it up and it tells them how long it's going to take. And so then they can decide whether or not they're going to devote. Uh, so it, it supports micro learning in, in that regard. Um, one of the newer features that we've added is we use Amazon's Poly, uh, which is a neural network to create high quality um, uh, text to speech or lifelike text to speech. I'll just uh, play one for you here. I think I shared my audio. How instructional designers approach conflict with faculty. Using a multiple case study approach, we interviewed. So that is available. That is easily available in all of our content. Um, so again, we provide multimodality in that regard. Um, anything is accessible also as a, uh, so if I, like in a situation like this, if I'm presenting to a group or I'm at a conference, I can um, click the share button and there's a QR code for every book and every chapter in every book. So you could just hold up your phone and scan that and it'll jump to this chapter. So if I'm lecturing uh, to a class or something like that, I can allow my students to jump to it directly. And a lot of this again is, is a response to pain points that I found with other systems in the past. I remember being an instructional designer wanting to design a course for students and I couldn't even send a student to a direct, give them a direct link to a chapter. And that was so frustrating for me. Um, but so this really just trying to provide Get them directly to, to the content directly. You also see you can embed it as an iframe. Let me show you very quickly what that looks like in the learning management system. Um, so the way that I use this in my classes, sorry, I have multiple pop-ups that are in the way. So uh, my institution uses can Canvas. And so um, here's an example of a course I teach. Sorry, there it is. So my students are going through Canvas. They have their modules here um, where they might have assignments, but then um, this link right here, this takes them to EdTech Books. So it's, it's embedding the EdTech book directly into Canvas. Um, and so this works just by well, in Canvas, you just add an external URL and you paste the URL and it embeds it directly. Um, so there's this version. Let me show you one other thing, though. Um, so this is the default version, but also all the content is available in a simple view. So if you just append the word simple to the end of any chapter, it'll strip out the, um, the navigation. It'll strip out the branding for the site and all that kind of stuff. So you can embed this in your learning management system. And that allows it to uh, your students to have a completely seamless experience in your LMS. They don't even know that the content is coming from somewhere else. Uh, and so I think this is really key. And I, I see this as preferable to like, you know, sharing PDFs, for instance, that people are, you know, putting in their learning management systems, because what this allows us to do is if my textbook is being used by 20 different universities, if I update my content, um, it'll be updated across all those learning management systems instantly because it's embedded, it, they're embedding my content rather than uh, uploading the file or something like that. So it allows us to, um, to keep content com uh, cont cont continuously up to date as it's shared across all these institutions. Yeah. You know, Royce, uh, a couple of questions are starting to stack up actually already. Yeah, I've, got yeah. a couple, I've got a couple of my own um, and um, we've got some from the, uh, the crowd as well. So um, Jonathan asked about um, open licensing of the works and so yeah. He noticed some Creative Commons icons on some works, but he's wondering what the affordances were around uh, open licensing. Yeah, so the way that it works is that any, now I'm jumping into the authoring. Stuff. Yeah, and if you're going to cover this later, that's fine. Well, let me make a note of that. And okay. give me one more second, and then we'll jump to authoring. Okay. Um, and then, uh, Go ahead. A couple of other questions on the sharing, though, um, if you don't mind. Uh, you you talked a lot about the uh, the linkability aspect, which I thought was very cool. And I'm wondering um, when, uh, say, an author wants to update links that they've made, like change the the actual wording of them, does it yeah. um, does it redirect from the old links as well? Yeah. So no, not currently. I mean, okay. that's a feature we could potentially add, but the reason for that is just so that we don't have we're we you know so we're not using unneeded um, domains like. 
like these gotcha. um so like this one it's it's just slash id right and so if they wanted this to point there and they wanted design to point to it then that would use id and design um but so right now like if you change the url we don't we don't maintain the old link for you gotcha gotcha um, for, for that simple reason but that could be a possibility um, yeah just i know there's there's something built into wordpress that basically redirects i mean if you're yeah. using the right plugins it redirects to old old versions of the the url to new right um, and I mean, like, yeah, and that's one of the trade-offs, like where we're going on the side of like shorter URLs. And um, so if you have longer URLs, then you have more, more flexibility to do things like that. Gotcha. On a, you know, sort of similar on, on a similar lines. Um, what about versioning? So like if there yeah. were like an edition of a, of a book that were published that one maybe didn't want <laughs> getting to change? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I, I, no. I, yeah. So let's yeah. just note that to bring up in your natural flow. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then um, one other thing that uh, just sort of popped up um, while I was looking at um, all this really great and exciting work um, was, <laughs> oops, it dropped out of my mind. Okay, I'm gonna just let you go then because it sounds right. like you've got you've got a you've got a, a a plan to go. And I'll just note people are talking about um, backing up to the Internet Archive, backing up whatever, yeah. <laughs> making copies available in the Internet Archive as an additional sort of like fail safe. So yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess one more thing about the reader's experience, and we'll jump to the author's experience. You'll notice here we have like a rating system. Uh, this is based on every single chapter and every single book has a default chapter quality survey at the end. Authors can also create their own custom surveys, but these are aggregated across books. And the, the reason for this is to try to sit to uh, first to help to ensure quality. Um, so that authors know like how their chapters are performing, but also so that readers can know kind of like a like an Amazon kind of rating. They can see um, you know what are what whether a resource is high quality or not. And then there are also badges we can assign for a particular books. So like this journal, we can see here that it's peer reviewed. Um, it, it it constitutes original research and it, there are expert authors involved. So all these are intended to be indicators to help someone understand whether or not this is a high quality resource. Um, so let me jump back to this one. Uh, so this one, you can see it's high quality. And if you click on any of these, it'll explain what they mean. So high quality means um, it gets an average rating of 3.5 or higher on a five point quality scale across all the chapters in the book. Um, and so, and so each of these have a different requirement associated with them. So, so again, all this is that's there to try to push back or to help to support this idea of continuous improvement with OER, but also to signal the quality of OER to the people that are that are accessing it or might use it. And so those surveys, you probably maybe already said this, but they, the surveys aggregate against everyone using the book across any Correct. Any so system or, yeah. any chapter, if you scroll down to the bottom, there's this chapter, uh, end of chapter survey. So this is the default survey. You can also have your own custom surveys built in. Um, but so these aggregate across the entire book for anyone using the book. I guess that's another key point here is all the data, all the books and all the content is always public, um, meaning that there is no way to lock down access to a chapter or to a book that's very intentional. Um, the reason for that is I just saw a lot of, I think, systems that were kind of open washing or like they're at their approach was um, to be kind of open, but not really open. And I just um, I guess the, the one of the guiding principles of what we're doing here is ensuring that everything is always open. So there's no there's no um, there's no way to use this system in a way that would lock it down to a particular only a particular uh, group of people. Gotcha. Hey, I just remembered what my other question was, and I think it's more on the sharing side. So maybe it's appropriate to bring up yeah. here. Um, you were showing off how it could be easily embedded in LMS, and that was really cool with the simple uh, embedding and everything. Um, have Is there a way to uh, use something like a thin common cartridge to bring in an entire work as a series of um, kind of single links, like if you wanted to bring in the whole chapter structure and maybe reorganize or delete some so of them? From Ed Tech Books to a different platform? Yeah. So um, I don't, it doesn't export as a thin common cartridge. We do have an open API. Um, so, and I can show you the information about this, but so like if I go to this URL api.php and I put in book equals ID, it gives me all the it's this is all in JSON format. Mm -hmm. So I could use this to so anyone could use this to program anything to bring in the content to any other system. Sure. 
Um, Makes sense. So that is the main way of exporting it. Um, or I mean, that's the, the underlying functionality, but like building things that actually export to specific pa types of packages. Um, not all of that's been done yet. Yeah, I, but I was just thinking on um, Rock and Mossbacher did some great work uh, to make uh, press books export as thin CCs, thin com cartridges that made it really easy to pop the whole structure, just references to the structure, not embed, not embed it as a separate content piece, but like your right. re references well, think, to where it exists. What we find is that most of the time people don't want the entire chapter structure. They typically want to create their own structure. And so the main thing is to provide content to them in ways that they can, that is granular. So they can just bring in the content that they want, organize it the way that they want. Uh, but gotcha. that, that kind of a, an approach is, is doable for sure. Gotcha. Okay. Don't let okay. me interrupt you anymore. <laughs> no, it's great. Let's jump to the author's experience. So if you're on the site, you can log in just by clicking on this person icon, icon here in the top right. You have two options. You can log in using a Google account. So this can be any Google account um, or with ORCID. So I'm going to do my Google account. As you do that, it will prompt you the first time to choose a, an account type. So it'll ask, are you a student, teacher, a content creator? And that's just kind of to give you, help it figure out like what kinds of things to show you. So if you're gonna want, if you wanna create content, uh, you should choose content creator. You can still do some of these things with te the teacher um, approach or the teacher uh, account type, but uh, content creator gives you access to everything. Um, if you chose the wrong one or you want to adjust that, you can just click your picture up here in the top right and you can change your account type at any time. So just click that drop down and you can change it to change to a different experience. You'll also, while we're here, just see that there's uh, a lot of information that you can fill out here. This is used to generate a biography for you. Um, and this biography is shared across the entire system. So for instance, whenever I publish an article in the Journal of Applied Instructional Design, my, my biography is appended to that. Um, you can click public profile to see what that looks like. So it's pulling all this information that I provided in that, um, in that form um, to, to, show, to show, so this would be shown on anything that I, that I create. And so if I update it once, it's updated across all the books in the system, all the chapters in the system that I that I write and those kinds of things. And so- Hey Royce, let me ask you there, looking at your profile, is there a limit on the number of icons and references one can have in one's profile? Because you have quite yeah. a few. <laughs> yeah, so um, all of these are created from uh, from this form. So if I, if I have a personal website, then it will show it here. So, so the number of icons is determined by the system, the ones that are pre preset for you to give an option. So you can't come in and say, I want a new icon that goes, does this other weird thing, at least not currently. Um, so it's limited by the options that we have for you right here, but we can always add more options if that's, right. yeah. So. Well, you might not want to add an option for people to do other weird things because yeah, John, yeah. Jonathan will use it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so like you have your own author's website and you have a link for a CV. Those are fairly open to do whatever you want with, but these others are more standard. So like, pointing to your Twitter profile and so forth. Gotcha. Hey, and I see maybe you're getting to this, but Mia mm -hmm. had a question in the chat about the difference between a content creator and a teacher. Yeah. So, so I mean, you might go through roles here at some point. Yeah. So the main thing is just like what you see when you when you first log in here. Um, and I've changed this a little recently because I found a lot of people are assigning themselves as teachers when actually they want to be content creators. But um, it, it just, you have some different button options. So like if I switch to teacher, I come back here, uh, it looks the same for me, but like it might take away some options here if, if you're not a content creator. Um, like this create a new book link, it used to not be there for teachers, but I think I just added that because I had a lot of teachers that I guess they, a lot of people were wondering why they couldn't create content as a teacher. So um, the so it's really just this main page about what it's offering you here. Once you get into the book and start working on it, there's no difference between the different roles. The other things like we don't want students, for instance, to come in and start creating a bunch of books just for kicks. And so that's why we had the different roles. Um, Although that, that does uh, raise the question, of course, of, of student based uh, and produced and authored OER. Yeah. Well, absolutely. <laughs> and they can. And if you're an instructor, you can have students do that. Um, uh, but again, like the idea is we don't, you know, if you're not actually like building a project, like let's not gum up the works and have all these domains that aren't being sure. Used kinds of things. Sure, that makes sense. 
Um, so to create a new book, all you have to do is scroll down here. Or you probably don't have to scroll down. You click create a new book. You give your book a title. So um, we'll just create one here. So my OER book. I click additional settings. I can choose the, the location for it. So this is the, the URL. And if any and any on any setting in the system, you can hover on this question mark, and it'll it'll explain to you what uh, what that setting does. Um, if you are creating like a series of books, for instance, so like that journal, we have settings we want to copy from every version of the journal. So you can choose uh, if you already have a book in the system, you can choose a book, and it'll copy all the settings over from that book. We'll look at book settings in a second, but there are tons of settings you can adjust for your book. And so that just prevents you from, if you're creating like a new issue, you don't have to go in and, and put in all the settings. Again, you can just copy them directly that way. So I'm going to create a book. Um, I have a lot of books here, so, but you won't, don't, probably don't see the one that I just created, but it's this one right here. My OER book provides this default cover. If I click on that, um, I'll jump to this page. And so here's my book. Uh, it gives me a cover. This is where my table of contents will go and it has a progress bar. Um, so within the system, we'll start by looking at books. Anytime I want to edit something or work on something, I just click this drop down in the top right. This is a difference from like Pressbooks, for instance. Pressbooks takes the model of you have kind of a front end that, that users see and then you uh, your readers see and you have a back end that the author works in. Everything we do is on the front end. Um, and we find that's just a bit more accessible for, for people. So if you click settings, it doesn't take you to a different site or a different like layout or anything like that. Um, it, it feels like you're just working in the site directly. So as I mentioned, there are tons of settings here. Um, if you want to find a setting very quickly, just start typing. So I'm going to start typing copyright to get to the question earlier about licensing. Uh, so I can just choose from this drop down what copyright status I want to assign to this book. So I'm going to do CC BY. And by doing that, you notice it's saved automatically. So everything is done through REST calls. Um, so I don't have to worry about like losing information. Um, let me do something else. Let me adjust, uh, let me give it a subtitle. So again, it just saved it automatically. Now, what if I click to return to my reading view, you'll notice I have my subtitle here. If I scroll down, it now appends the license to the bottom. So you choose a license for the book, but then you can also choose a license for any chapter in the book. Um, if you don't choose a license for a chapter, the book's license applies to everything in the book, but you can override the book's license by choosing a license for individual chapters. So that's really helpful for like edited volumes. Uh, we've had authors that are pulling content from existing uh, resources. And so some of those they can't change the licensing on. So they might release the entire book as CC BY, but then they have specific chapters that have a different license associated with them. Um, uh, so, sorry to, to interrupt yeah. there. Are you going to go more into the licensing a little bit later, or is this the uh, chance to talk about licensing? We, we can talk about it. We don't, so I guess this group's different than most groups. So <laughs> most groups don't want to talk about licensing. We can if you'd like, but but I guess the philosophy is we're not enforcing any kind of licensing um, to just allow for multiple uses. Um, I, I'll look, I'll show you a second how you can quickly reuse and remix other people's stuff. So that is influenced by licensing. That was um, actually the direction I was interested in going. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me show you that really quickly. So uh, to create content, uh, there are a couple different ways of doing it. The simplest way, I just click the drop down and click this chapter button, so the plus chapter. Um, Glenn asks, why was unspecified an option? Just because we don't, I didn't want to enforce one uh, coming right in. So, um, so if you haven't chosen one, then it's not specified. But then, yeah, the expectation is that you would come in and you would specify one. Um, I tend to, to license everything as CC BY. I know there's some very strong feelings in the community about how things should be licensed. And so I guess that's the reason that I have, I don't have a default that it forces you to, to accept. Um, so to create a chapter, I click the drop down, click chapter, migrate chapter. Here again, uh, I can choose a short name for it. Uh, I can choose to put a Google Doc link, and if I do, it will Im it'll import content from Google Docs. So it'll import images directly from Google Docs. Um, and so what I tend to encourage people to do for the most part is if they're creating a book, create all their content in Google Docs, especially if it's a collaborative book. And then once you have it the place that you want, you just come paste in the URLs and it'll import it all from there. Um, 
create a chapter. So there's my new chapter. Notice it has an I here telling me it's not published yet. Uh, so I can do it that way. I can also come in and I can import content from a different book. So if I jump over here, this was that, uh, a book that I, a different book that I was looking at before my Ed Research book. If I click the drop down up here because I'm logged in, I can go to copy chapter and I can choose to put it in my OER book. So when I do that, I have an option here. I can either choose to synchronize it or remix it. So if I synchronize it, that will mean that if the original author over here on the Ed Research book changes it or updates it, it'll be updated in my version as well. If I remix it, that means I can make it my own. I can do whatever I want with it. My edits will be saved to it. I'm going to synchronize it for now. Copy chapter. So well, now it's going to add something. Yes. So if that chapter was no derivatives or a different license, would that stop you from being able to do that? And like you have up like that option. It, they're both your books. If it was someone else's book, does the license limit what you can do with it? Yeah, so it should. I have to go in and verify that. Um, that's on my list of things to, to ensure, but that, that button should go away if it is not released under a license that allows you to do that. Um, and, and like if it's no derivatives, then we'd have to remove the, the remixing option. You could still copy it into your chapter, but you couldn't remix it. So I, I in theory, that's how the way it's supposed to work. I need to go back and verify that's, that's how it works. Uh, so this chapter has been copied to my book. So now you can see I have my blank chapter that I created, and now I have this chapter that was imported. Um, it brought you know the images with it. It brought um, the audio, um, and then also it brings in the citation for the previous version. So this allows you to keep track of, of your required citations when you're remixing things. So it'll just copy that citation over for you. Um, hey, one quick one yeah. quick follow up, Rice, on the Google Docs import, which raised mm -hmm. a lot of oohs and ahs in the crowd. Um, how much formatting is maintained like yeah. bold, italics and links and so forth in that? In yeah, that yeah. So links, bold, italics should all come over. Um, as any of you who've done work with HTML know, like if you're trying to come from a word processor to HTML, there are always things that you lose. The main, main things that you would lose are like really complex formatting and tables or those kinds of things. So, so I think you wanna to try to lean toward as simple as possible in the Google Doc. Um, you don't wanna like put columns and those kinds of things, um, but, for the but it'll bring over all the simple formatting for sure. And then you can reformat it over here. Um, right, but like right. there's there, there are reasons for that too. I mean, it's not that we can't replicate a lot of things that are done in Google Docs or Microsoft Word. It's that a lot of them aren't accessible, and so, or they're not mobile friendly. And so, um, we're intentionally stripping a lot of things out just to try to make it simpler and more uh, more mobile friendly. So if one did have something like using a table for layout or some obnoxious right. thing like that, uh, the content would come over and and one could maybe work with it in the EdTech book side to, to make it uh, display better. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll show the editing in just a second. But cool. yeah, heading no and anchors, as Maha pointed out, yeah, all those would come over, footnotes would come over, those kinds of things. You've got you've got such a, uh, a kind of expert crowd here. People are jumping right ahead yeah, to the, the details. So let's jump into details then. So editing, um, so there are, there are several ways to edit things. The first way is what you're probably used to in press books or something like that. You just click the pencil. And then you have a tiny MC editor. Oh, it's letting me know this is a synchronized chapter. So before I edit it, I have to go and change the settings. So it's not synchronized. So now if I come back and edit, um, it's telling me that it's locked because I tried to edit it before, but okay, here it is. So I can use this tiny MCE editor to edit stuff. Um, I guess because of time, I'm not gonna jump into all of these, but you, know, you have all your basic functionality here. Um, we have some custom things built in, like you can put snippets of code, uh, for instance, you can put uh, it's APA formatting. Uh, there are also specific tools that you can embed. So like if you want to embed H5P, you just click tools, H5P, you put in the info there and it'll embed it. Uh, same with YouTube videos, you just put a link or, or the YouTube ID or the URL, it'll embed it that way. Um, there are lots of other things. Like it, we'll look at some of these in a second, but um, so this is the main editor that, that you would use. I'm going to cancel this. Uh, yeah, math, you can do LaTeX or MathML. Either one works. Um, um, yeah. Um, one of the things, okay, so there's that. 
Another feature that I really like, and I don't think the other systems have this, at least when I've used Pressbooks and others in the past, they don't have anything like this. I find that when I am doing micro edits on a chapter, it's really annoying to be reading through my chat, proofreading my chapter, find something here near the end. And then when I want to edit it, I have to go back to the back end or I have to click the pencil and I have to go find it again uh, where I want to edit it. So we have an inline editor. So you can just click on this button to turn on the inline editor and you come in and, and edit things directly on the on the content. So um, that just saved it. It's saved automatically. You don't have to click the save button or anything like that. So you'll notice if I refresh the page, it's been it's been updated. So um, this allows me to so to proofread it in the the way that it looks to a reader um, and edit it directly at the same time. Um, hey, one quick question. Yeah. There, Jonathan was asking if the um, LaTeX renderer is MathJax or something else. Yeah, it uses MathJax. Gotcha. Yeah. So when you're editing here, uh, let me just show you the LaTeX um, interface really quickly. Um, it's very simple. Uh, sorry, LaTeX equation. Um, that's why. So here in this in the tiny MC editor, it'll just look like something like this, but then it'll use MathJax to to render it here. Okay. Um, so just like with the book, there are a bunch of book settings. There are tons of chapter settings as well. So if I click the drop down here, I can go to settings for the chapter. Again, I can find the thing that I'm looking for by typing in my like copyright. I, this is where I would choose the the overwrite for if I want only if I wanted this one to be a different license than the entire book, for instance. I also at chap with chapters have this feature on some things where say I decide copyright's not a good example of this. Let's find one, let's say PDFs. Um, so the system rebuilds PDFs in the background. And so let's say that I want it just for some reason, I want it to rebuild the PDFs or I want to change the study. I want to tell it um, um, not to allow PDF conversion for this chapter. I just switch that off. But then if I click this button, it'll apply it to all other chapters as well. So I can push it to, to every chapter in the book without going to the settings for every chapter and, and changing settings that way. Um, and there are tons of things here that we could talk through. Um, I don't know what's super helpful right now, um, but I guess just to talk about publishing a little bit, um, here it says visibility instead of publishing because everything if I, if I give you this URL, you could go to it on the web. So you can share anything that you create with anyone, whether or not it's published. Um, the way that we maintain quality insurance with the site overall, while at the same time allowing for anyone to do basically whatever they want in the system without like having, you know, being gatekeepers, uh, there, there's like a balance that we have to strike there. And so the balance that we strike is anyone can create a book, anyone can publish the chapters in their book. So if I publish this, chapter. Now, if someone comes to my book, they'll see this chapter is in the table of contents. They'll be able to access it. Um, and so anyone can do all that, but um, only a site admin can choose to publish a book. Now, again, like um, I can share this link with my class. I could post this to, to Twitter or anything like that, but it would not show up here on the main sites uh, on these books that we have vetted or whatever. So to get a site to show or a book to show up on the main site and like be findable with keywords and to be Google indexed, uh, you, we have to flip a switch to that for that. And again, to, to help ensure quality, we give you a quality assurance checklist to go through. So that's here on the book's main page. There's a proofing tab. This gives you a list of things to, to check for in your book. So for instance, making sure you have sufficient contrast, you go through and do all of these things. Um, and then once, once you do that, you just let us know and then we'll, we can switch on your book um, so that it's, it's then indexed and it's listed with everything else. So, so it, it's a balance we have to strike between, again, being very inclusive and allowing anyone to create anything, but also trying to maintain some level of quality assurance in what we are promoting to, to people who come to the system. Hey, um, um, Royce, can yeah. I ask one question? I, and again, if you're going to dive more into the licensing stuff later, that's fine. Yeah. I'm so, sorry that. Uh, no, it's good. Sorry that I keep circling back on that. It's not just because I work for Creative Commons. Um, 
Uh, I noticed that, you know, when you were bringing the chapters in, there was that option to synchronize or to mm -hmm. make a copy, right? That makes sense. And I think we kind of covered this, but when you, just as, so it's totally clear to me, when we synchronize a chapter um, and it has particular licensing, is it possible to override that licensing in the so synchronized was, copy? Yeah, so that was Maha's question. And uh, I actually don't remember how okay. I it. And so, but that is something now that I really need to go back and do. But yeah. I mean, like the short answer is anyone can ever can circumvent copyright whenever, right? They can oh, just, sure, yeah. They could just select a copy and paste it, right? But yeah. we obviously don't want to encourage people to do that. Yeah, so. it's, I'm not even concerned so much about like, you know, purposeful misuse as it is just like the idea. I think people, listen, the, Licensing is a complicated field. It's too complicated, right? right? Um, and I uh, don't like to, you know, uh, beat people around the head with licensing because it's just, it gets in the way of what people really want to do. But, you know, when a piece is, is licensed already and one is synchronizing to it, it seems like it would be best if one couldn't override the license just because it might lead right. people to attach different licenses to things that would then be out in the world with this different license that the original author didn't apply. So. Right, and, and Ma points out, I mean, you could do this a couple of ways. You could just remind people. Um, and, and I think part of the reason that that hasn't come up in the past is most of the stuff that we have is CC by license. So it's not it's not an issue. Um, mm -hmm. But again, we want we want to be, for people to be able to share the way that they want to share and you know making sure the mechanism supports that effectively is um, yeah. is something that we need to work at. I mean I think putting putting choice in the hands of the creator is is the right way to go you know the, the best general logic. Yeah. Um Absolutely. and or is is something that you're going to do here um also to dive into a little bit more if one were building a chapter out of components from different places? Yeah, yeah, so we can look at that. So Okay. So like the modularity of it is intended to be at the at the chapter level. So it's easy to copy an entire chapter over um you know just like with anything else you could select a couple paragraphs copy and paste into the editor I don't have a way for you to, you know, break down and just say, I want this part of this chapter. You can just pull an entire chapter and then edit it down the way that you want. Um, but there's not a way to, I guess, say, I want this section for this chapter and this section for this chapter. You just have to select it and copy and paste it. Um, so the versioning question from before, when you're editing, it does track versioning. So I, I see revisions here. You can see what I that I made some micro edits. I can jump back in time to a previous version. Um, I can add version notes if I like. Um, if I add version notes, those will be listed here next to the version to explain it. So this is helpful if I'm working on a team. Um, the collaboration aspect of this is that you can add authors. Um, so I'm going to come in here in the drop down for the book and go to authorship. Uh, I can add authors. So I'm going to add Maha to this one. Um, and I could list her as a visible author or a hidden author. Visible author means that she'll show up uh, in the byline, she'll show up in the citations, it builds the citations for me down here. Um, if I list her as an invisible author, like, sorry, I should be on authorship, like, uh, like a student editor or something like that, they still have all editor access, they just won't be listed in those different things. So I can add authors to at the book level. And if you're added at the book level, that gives you permission to add chapters, reorganize chapters, and all those kinds of things. Um, I, get, I guess I didn't show this. You can organize chapters by coming here. You can drag chapters around, change the indentation of them, and so forth. So you can create hierarchies of chapters. Um, but then also at each chapter, you can go to authorship and you can add uh, you can get permission to just edit that chapter. So I can add visible or hidden authors at the chapter level as well. So like if I'm teaching a class, so back to your question about student authorship, um, one example of this that I do in my class is I have this running book, The Student's Guide to Learning Design and Research, um, where my first semester writing students, their writing project is to write a chapter for this, for this book. Um, so I give each student access, editing access to the chapter that they, that they have chosen to write on. Um, and so they can upload their content or write it in Google Docs and import it over. Um, but then I and maybe an editing student um, have full access to the entire book. So, so it's managed that way um, uh, for, for teams and things. Um, so oh, I that could also help with an author who wanted to, to remain anonymous for other reasons, right? Correct. Um, 
You can also, imp so like you can copy a chapter from an existing book. You can also pull one. So if I've just created this book, I can go to import here. Um, if I have another book in the system, I can just choose this. It'll list all the books that I own. And then I could either, I could click this button and it would go through and import all. Let me find a short book. All my books are too long, apparently. Um, here, here's one. So if I just click this, it'll go through and it'll import every chapter from that book. Um, so there that is. Uh, we also have a Pressbooks import. Uh, if you should put in the URL and tell it whether you want the pages or the posts, it'll go and import them that way. And so that's not just Pressbooks, but any WordPress? Any WordPress, yeah. Um, oh, wow, well, we could archive our website that way. Yeah, so we actually- time we start fresh. So like I have a colleague now, Tori Trust, who's moving over her. She has a, oh, it might actually not be published. Yeah, let me see, sorry. Yeah, so this was her WordPress site, Online Tools for Teaching and Learning, but uh, it's hosted by, uh, she, she, yeah, she wanted to adjust hosting, so she just imported it uh, from then. So these are all pages from that. Actually, that one's not formatted yet. Let me find one that's formatted properly. And so, yeah, so this is imported from her WordPress site. And also, um, you can do a lot of other things, like for instance, this pulls all the abstracts and the icons for each chapter. So it builds interfaces like this for you that are a bit nice. Uh, H5P, I did mention H5P, Laura, you can embed H5P within chapters. Um, there are a couple ways of doing it, but yeah, you, the simple way is you just come and edit a chapter and uh, you can either look and go in the code, um, uh, sorry, my, my brain is turning off right now. You can go to the source code and you can paste in the UR, paste in the, the iframe, or you have a tool here where you can go to H5P and you can put in the plug in the information there. Um, so it's not a so the system is not an H5P host. You have to create your H5P elsewhere, but if it's hosted elsewhere, you can embed it. And anything that's hosted elsewhere, you can you can embed as long as the other site allows that to happen. Um, I guess another cool thing um, that I don't know that other systems do is CSS customization. So you can do this both at the chapter level and the book level. So if I come into the book, go to settings and type in CSS, uh, I can add any CSS that I want here and it'll apply to the entire book. So that's why, uh, like for instance here, if I scroll down, you'll notice like the, the heading, the call out boxes are a particular color, this heading uses this image, all that's done with CSS. So as the author, I don't have to go in and add this image every single time I have a heading. I just change one line of code in the CSS for the book and it's applied to every chapter in the book. Um, so that's great for formatting. Um, you could, yeah, chapter level CSS, an example of that is over here. So this author, they have some book level CSS, but they also wanted each chapter, like the headings in each chapter to match this color that they're, that they're going through for the chapters. So they just applied some chapter level CSS for each of these chapters to change the, the background headings, backgrounds and the headings. Um, everything builds, me sorry, did you have a question about that, Nate? I uh, know, I just said nice, sorry, I'm just, a, I should probably <laughs> limit myself to chat when I say things like nice, I know. don't want to interrupt you. Um, so it builds metadata in the background, so things like Dublin Core, and for instance, everything is Google Scholar indexed. Um, so for instance, this Jade, um, journal, we can click on anything. And over here, we can again get the citation or you click this button, it'll jump to Google Scholar, try to find it on Google Scholar. So there it is, I can see the citations. Um, yeah, so Maha, uh, everything is designed to be mobile first and it should be accessible. Uh, you know, I periodically do web uh, wave aim tests on everything. So the system should be accessible. But you know there are always possibilities of people when they're when you give them power to edit content directly, they can do things that are inaccessible. So like we have prompts that like encourage people. So like if you turn on the inline editor, for instance, it'll put a red box around any image that needs an alt tag associated with it. Um, also with the uh, uh, with our proofing tool here, the quality assurance checklist. A lot of this is here to help you to see. Um, uh, to make sure that your content is accessible. And some of these provide automatic checks. It'll go through and make sure all your images have proper descriptions and those kinds of things. 
Uh, and you can click here, for instance, this will show you all the images in this book along with their alt text. Like this one needs to be corrected. Um, so like these, this alt text is not appropriate. So that would need to be corrected by the authors. Um, yeah, and so like in terms of like accessibility for other formats, uh, the PDF builder it comes directly from HTML. Um, and so it, it tends to bring over all the accessibility features from the HTML. So if it's accessible in HTML, it tends to be accessible for the most part in PDF. Um, it also builds a table of contents allows allowing for navigation in the PDF. Um, I guess one of the kind of philosophies of this is that you know, where we're mobile or we're web first, and that's kind of the expectation. We, we design well for the web first, everything else is kind of icing on the cake. So the PDF is nice, but ultimately it's the web version that we want to make sure is the, is the kind of heart of it. Um, and there are other formats. So any content as well, this isn't published anywhere, I don't think, but any content is also available as a Word document. So I just append to the end of any URL ms underscore word. Uh, it'll download a Word document that has all the has this this chapter as uh, as a Word doc. So I could just edit that Word doc directly. Um, and so forth. So yeah, and I mentioned there are two PDF layouts. So this is one of the reasons for that for accessibility. So there's a mobile PDF. This is optimized for um, like a tablet screen. And then there's also a printable PDF, which is optimized for an eight and a half by 11 letter page for printing. Yeah, oh, cool. Thanks, Clarissa. Um, we also have one that was in, that's an alpha for PowerPoint so that you could download an entire chapter and just as PowerPoint slides, but that's not ready, ready quite yet. Um, I think I'm out of time, right? Well, yeah, I just, <clears throat> we don't have any. I mean, hard stop other than you maybe having to leave um, or other folks. I don't. Let me just like run through a few different features really quickly, and then we can do whatever you all want to do, and you're welcome yeah. to leave if you need to. So a couple of things. So I, I, I promise I mentioned Hypothesis, Nate. You can turn on Hypothesis. A books can be turned. It just takes a single click. Let me find one that does it. So this one does. So if you go to the settings for the book and start typing in Hypothesis, you just select this to turn it on. And um, then it'll show up on your chapter. So here I have a hypothesis over here on the right side. I can highlight things, I can annotate, and so forth. Um, there are tons of analytics built in. So for every chapter in every book, you can click on the analytics tab. And it gives you a lot of information about what's happening on the chapter or the book. So it gives you the, qual the, you know, the quality assurance survey results. It gives you the page views, a number of times PDFs been downloaded. We have an algorithm that predicts cost savings that we're continually trying to refine. And so a lot of this is to try to justify to uh, tenure and promotion committees, the value and the impact of the work that we're doing. So, so like that's a big emphasis for me right now is building dashboards and those kinds of things to allow you to make the case to uh, people that you need to make the case to that this work is having high impact. Um, uh, but also things to, to inform continuous improvement, like it predicts the Flesh Kincaid reading score, uh, and encourages you to make it simpler. Um, it predicts the reading likelihood. So based on user time on page and scrolling behaviors, if someone, so of these uh, 5.4 thousand users who came to this site, to this page, this is the likelihood that they actually read it um, based on, based on, again, what they're doing on the page and so forth. Um, you know, I can see backlinks. So for this particular chapter, we see uh, San, San Francisco State University is using it, uh, BYU is using it. We have a lot of traffic from Google and then we have other. So like um, all this is available, like these interfaces, we don't show everything that we have access to, but we're con continuously just trying to improve this um, to, make, to make valuable information available. You can also use Google Analytics with any of this. So for any book, uh, you can feed, you can use Google Analytics with a book or with multiple books. So if you, if you have 10 books on the site, you can put the same Google Analytics ID in all books, and then they'll all feed into the same Google, Google Analytics engine for you. Um, and I guess I'll just show you, these are some of our analytics for the entire site. So we have about, we've been averaging between 100 and 150,000 unique users a month um, for the EdTech books content um, for the past, and we've been doing this for about three years. Um, so there's that. 
Uh, oh, something that we do that no one else does is A-B testing. So I don't know if this is of interest to anyone, but continuous improvement is, is really important to me and providing tools for helping people to do continuous improvement is important. So like what an A-B test is, is this something like, like Google or Facebook use that like if you're creating an interface or you're creating a resource, you can test how different uh, minor changes are affecting user behaviors. So for instance, a simple question might be, do, uh, does the inclusion of um, stock photos have any effect on the likelihood someone's going to read my chapter? Does it affect the perception of quality or anything like that? So here's a chapter that I have. Um, I can create an A-B test with it by just going to settings and we call it flights actually. Uh, flights, I can create a new flight here. Um, but if I create a new flight, what it does, it makes a copy of the chapter. So you'll see I have a no stock photos version here that I already created. So it makes a copy of the chapter. I can come in and delete the no stock photos. But, and then when I look at analytics, um, I can see a comparison between the two. So I can set it either to manually, so I have a different URL for the no stock photos version, or I can have it automatically assign people. So if you're coming to that chapter from a Google search, you're randomly assigned to one of the two groups so I can see how, so I can do an experimental design on it to see if that's actually affecting what's happening. So in this particular case, you'll see um, this, this, this one's been up for a long time. So we actually have quite a bit of data um, and there's a lot here, but like reading likelihood. So people are slightly less likely, let me see. So no stock photos. Yeah, so people are less likely to read the book or read this chapter if there's no stock photos, if there are no stock photos, but it has no overall impact on perceptions of quality. Um, and so all these other things here are something I didn't mention is that you can have like learning checks or surveys within your chapter as well. So as my students are reading, I can plug in a learning check right here, similar to H5P, but this is using our internal system so we can track all the analytics associated with it. Um, but so you can also see how maybe those A-B tests or those changes are affecting learning, they're, how they're affecting whether or not your students are actually comprehending um, what it is you're trying to convey. So for instance, if I have a diagram that's explaining a difficult concept, I could actually use this as a way of testing to see if my students, if that diagram is helping them or if text is better or a video is better or whatever. Uh, I, I, wrote, I wrote a paper on this recently, actually in Jade about A-B testing. Um, I guess one of the takeaways is that it just takes a lot of data to do A-B testing well. And so um, I think this is really cool. If you have a book that is getting a lot of traction, you can do some kind of A-B testing. But if you're just doing this with your class or something, you're never gonna get enough uh, of a user base to, to get reasonable results, unless you leave it up for years and years. Uh, but so it's a cool thing, but it's not useful maybe for everybody. Uh, a couple other quick things. Um, you can embed you can embed anything. One of the ways that we make this easy is uh, we have an artifacts feature. Let me just sign in for this right here to show you an example that they're working on right now for chemistry. Uh, so for this book, the author wanted to have the chemistry text. This, and this text is pulled from OpenStax. Uh, but then she also wanted to embed Google Docs at the end for her slides. This is a presentation uh, and then like a PDF from Google Docs. Uh, we also have people wanting to do this for things like articulate storyline and so forth. Um, so we have a really simple way of doing that. All you have to do is go into settings and you can add what are called artifacts. And if you just paste a link, whether to a YouTube video, a Google Doc, uh, again, articulate storyline or anything like that, it'll just embed it um, at the end at, or at the beginning, you get to choose, and then you can put headings associated with it as well. Um, yeah, Nate, about testing, yeah. So like right now, the implications of it, the ethics of it, um, I think those are really important questions. Um, at this stage, you know, are really just trying to think, really trying to see like, is something like this even helpful or, or valuable for OER? I think that, Again, my goal is to put tools in the hands of researchers, and then if they can, you know, do stuff with it that's effective and helpful, then that's great. Um, but 
yeah, I think like if you do are doing automatic assignment then having something that, so, so that's why there's a manual versus automatic feature. So like if I'm doing this with a class, I don't, I think that there are problems with, with, you know, providing different learning experiences to students in my class. Um, versus if it's just people coming to my site from Google, um, I see there's a little bit more room for being able to, to see how it's affecting their experience in that way. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> let me let me jump in for a minute sure, here. Since sure. I've been on the IRB for like 10 years at this point, you only have to um, have an IRB proposal if you are going to publish the results. If you're just looking at them, that's qualitative. That's um, yeah, that's like uh, that's QA. I can't think of what Q is. <laughs> it's <laughs> quality really assurance. Sporting. Quality Thank assurance. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, yeah, and, and IRB. And so, Human subjects research, which human subjects research, at least in the US, is defined as identifiable private information. Um, so nothing here is identifiable, it's used for continuous improvement, as and as Clarissa said, it's not being published. Um, sorry, Clarissa, Clarissa, if I cut you off. Yeah, no, no, it's absolutely true. So once it's an identifiable, and you you do need, I mean, you can't just assume that because you aren't collecting identifiable information that you're exempt. Than the IRB because not every because IRBs tend to want to still see that and tell you that you're exempt as opposed to <laughs> you just right. saying it. But in terms of what we're doing here, it's quality assurance until you publish it, folks. So you don't need an IRB until you're specifically going after it and publishing it. And since it's aggregated already, I don't know how you would have a problem with an IRB proposal. Yeah. Uh, it's Jonathan unmuted for a millisecond. Um, this this conversation is making me very nervous because it seems to me that there are things here that really are could affect students. Suppose you made two different versions of Huck Finn, one with and one without the N word, mm -hmm. right? That would be and then like studied the kind of learning outcomes, right? And then you know the IRB might care because some students might find that offensive and might well, might might you know the point is the harm potential harm you're doing to people. I totally agree with Rissa that it's about whether you publish in the end, but as scholars. We always, if we find something interesting, we're going to publish it in the end. So you always got to think ahead um, about this. So I, I don't know. The, the IRB sucks, but yeah. it's there for a reason. Yeah, no, and I completely agree. And um, I think, again, I, part of the question is, like, if you're creating a system, create a system that allows, I, that's not to say that the system doesn't have any moral responsibility about how it's used, For obviously. There's something that we need to think through to make sure that these tools aren't being used in unethical ways. Um, but um, but yeah, I guess started this to even think, is this even something that's possible? Could Because I think there is some great potential benefit to thinking through how we can really think through continuous improvement with OER, uh, because we this allows us to do things with continuous improvement that we cannot do through a traditional publishing mechanism. And I think that there's some real potential value with that. Um, but as, yeah, as scholars, hopefully we can figure that out because there are some unique ethics around this that I, I think you're right. We need to, we need to explore some more. Uh, side note, I do like a lot of data mining research and those kinds of things. And that's another world where there is like, all, uh, there's a huge, there are huge ethical questions about how we do that that are not traditionally covered by an IRB or at least thought about. Uh, at my, my previous university, I remember submitting data mining uh, IRB proposals and they just, there's like, what? This isn't human subjects research. We don't care. But I'm like, well, but there are some really serious ethical implications here that you're not aware of. But um, so, I, so I guess I'll just say, like, yes, we build tools, but I guess as scholars, we do need to figure out how to do this ethically as well. Um, we probably shouldn't even get into this, but there are obviously other governing structures besides IRB, for instance, correct. the GDPR in Europe um, and California's privacy laws, which wouldn't apply here because you're not big enough, um, you know would affect privacy privacy issues as well. Um, yeah, I guess I would just encourage further exploration on that because um, I'm wary of systems that leave ethical questions for later. Hmm. I'll just put it that way. So I encourage I encourage continued exploration of those issues. Well, and I completely appreciate that. Um, I think just to be clear, one of the things that we're doing that I think has made it that less of an issue is that there's no there's no private information collected at all, um, nothing that could be connected back to to anyone's browser location or anything like that. It's it's all anonymous. And so 
that doesn't again absolve us from ethical ethics, but it does. But it, it is a safe a safety one safety measure that's in place. Gotcha. That's great. You know, and uh, hey, uh, maybe uh, there's so many things here. Obviously, and and you know, the, in the short time we had, you you were able to show quite a bit off. Um, and there's probably even more hidden under the hood, but maybe we'll leave that for another time. And maybe I could just end on one last um, bigger, bigger question. Um, having myself worked in the kind of open educational tool space for quite a while, one question I always come back to is someone can create a fantastic tool, which obviously you've done here. Just so many things about it are, I don't even necessarily want to say groundbreaking because they've been done in various places, but they've been brought together here. Mm -hmm. for this particular use case in, 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 in a way that we have seen maybe with some other open tools for education. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the real question that I have is around sustainability. And so, yeah. you know, like as we, as we put, as everyone, you <laughs> and all the coders who may be working on it with you and all the people who are putting content in this platform, think about, you know, where it's going to go in the future. What are your ideas about how this project is going to sustain itself uh, in an ongoing way? Yeah, so great question. So like, um, as I approached, as I started this, I didn't want to fall into the trap that a lot of, I've seen it happen a lot in OER and EdTech more broadly, honestly, where either people engage in like a bait and switch where they have a tool that they create and then a couple of years later, it's no longer open or it's like, um, um, but also it's not thinking ahead, right? So like we've intentionally not grown um, very quickly to make sure that it's sustainable. <laughs> Um, and none of this is soft funded. Everything that I've shown you is hard funded through our department and all of our faculty are using it. In our department now, our students spend less than $50 a year on textbooks, as opposed to in our university, it's about 800 and in the US it's about 1200. So our, our department is fully invested in this and we're able to provide this service to the world for only about $50 a month. That's what we pay Amazon Web Services to host all of this for over 150,000 users. Um, so I have no concerns about my department and my college supporting this for a long time. Um, down the road, both for our purposes, our uses, and also for everyone else's. Um, I think down the road for sustainability, one of the key choices will be to make the source code open so that anyone can install it locally. So there's not concern about that. Uh, I think being able to export the content is really essential. So you can export it all as PDF. So you have access to the API. Um, you can take the HTML and move it to Pressbooks if you wanted to. So there's that. We don't you know, claim to own the content or anything like that. Um, I do see down the road a potential need to um, start a nonprofit um, to allow for some kind of a business model, which we, we just haven't done because we haven't needed to, because we're able to do everything on such a small budget that, that there hasn't been a need to move in that direction. But if we grow 20 times our current size in terms of user base, then that would be necessary. Um, to make that happen, there are a couple of different models I've been thinking about. Um, Again, we would not go in any direction that, um, I don't know, that I don't like. So some of the models that I that I like, is like I like the Wikipedia model, just relying upon some donations. So just having, if you're an author, you can put a donate, uh, a donate button on your book. Um, we would not do like advertising or anything like that. Um, we would not have a, a, a pay to use service. Um, you know, another model that we might follow for sustainability would be if like your university wanted your own custom version of it, you know, we could host it for you on its own server and then, you know, um, we could provide that. But, but again, my goal, my passion is to provide this freely to everybody who wants to use it. Um, one of the, I didn't mention this, one of the things I'm working on right now is allowing for localization, even when people don't have internet access. So like on a Rachel server, we're working with um, some folks in Ghana right now to um, allow them to install it on a local Rachel server so they can not only access content, but they can create content. And then whenever they have internet access, we can sync the two uh, with one another. So that's another win for sustainability uh, because then you could, you could sustain it in your local institution, even if you don't have internet access. Um, thanks, Monica, that's great feedback. That'd be good in Alaska as well. Uh, but yeah, so that's, um, so th that's another another thing that's down the road. So 
So I don't know if that helps to assuage your fears at all, Nate, but I do hear that. I mean, that's an important question that I think about a lot, uh, but we are being very intentional about it. But I guess just the, the reality is we haven't had to, to do anything drastic. And when I think drastic, I think we haven't had to start our own nonprofit uh, just because we've done it in such a way that it is extremely sustainable just in our, just in the, the current structures that we have as faculty. Um, and like, honestly, especially in my field, this has become such a required resource by like ed tech folks and ID folks across, across the world that like, if I asked faculty at other universities, I don't think they'd have any problem like committing annual funds to it, to, to sustain it. We just haven't needed to do that. So we haven't. Um, yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no underlying motive to start a business here or anything like that. Like, um, and so I guess that's also why, like, I talked to like the tech transfer office and they just don't know what to do with me because uh, they're like, you don't want to sell this? I'm like, no, <laughs> like, well, so they don't know what to do with me. And so that's fine. I, I don't care as long as we can, at the end of the day, do what we care about. That's all that I, that's all that I care about. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, your motives seem, seem golden. Um, and I guess I would just say that, you know, it, one of the issues is that when a project is tied so closely to a single person, as I believe right. this one is maybe tied to you, right. no, that it itself, is. you know, creates a, a you know, a, a problem in terms of sustainability, just because you're a human being, right. your life will do different things, right? Um, hopefully all good. Um, I okay. absolutely agree. And I think, again, like, we, I think we're moving in our department so that it's moved more away from me so like there's the the technology aspect of it that it that has historically been me we're going to, we're transitioning that more to our department and more towards to graduate students that are hard funded through our department. Um, the content aspect is is the community, um, and so that's not specific to a single sure. person. By any sure. uh, Jonathan asked about ownership. Um, no, the tech transfer office wants to think that they do, but uh, but they don't. Um, so I have ownership of the code, so I can do whatever I want. And have you looked at your, your contract that you signed with the university to make yeah, sure yeah. that's true? Okay, good. <laughs> cool. Well, you know, I think um, we probably should bring it to a close there. Um, this was a fantastic conversation. I think we went really deep into the hands-on aspects and also talked about some of the bigger questions. So I really want to thank Royce for, for sharing the extra time that you did today, as well as just being here in general. I will say also uh, to remind people to join the, the kickoff conversation later this afternoon um, that we're running a little bit ahead of if you want to um, kind of think about the more global aspects. And Jonathan has his and uh, Veronica both had their hands up. If you wanted to say one last thing. Nope, nope. Well, you'd ask about Slack. I, I'm, I don't think I'm on the Slack channel for my fest, but you're welcome to reach out to me on Twitter or email me. Um, I'm on Slack too. I just need an, an invite to whatever <laughs> any, any channel you want to. We can, we can make sure that you get one if you want, Royce. All right, well, thank you so much. Like I say, I can talk about this all day and this is what I'm passionate about if you can't tell, so. Um, yeah, for sure. I think we need to make all these uh, an hour and a half long, even though people say that sounds too long, but does, is it really? Thank you, Royce. I really appreciate your being here today. And thank you all so much.